Hello and welcome to Make It Happen with Will Polston. I'm Will Polston. This is episode number 134 and in this episode I'm joined by Helen Sanderson. Helen is a psychotherapist, interior designer and one of the UK's most well-respected clutter experts, appearing regularly on TV, radio and podcasts. Her book, The Secret Life of Clutter, has been described as a love letter to clarity. Helen helps people create beautifully organised, clutter-free homes and live more mindful and meaningful lives. She works with her clients holistically to uncover what their homes reveal about their psyches and what's blocking them from letting go and moving on. Her ethos is to work with compassion and to empower people to take positive action to support change. This leads to life-changing shifts which leaves people with a newfound clarity, homes they love, that love them back. And in this episode, we're going to be talking about the secret life of clutter. So, Helen, welcome to the show. Hi, nice to be here. Thank you. So this is interesting because um, I, um, not not so long ago at the time of recording this, start, started moving house. And I, I don't believe in coincidences. I believe in synchronicities. Mm-hmm. And um, at, at the time, I was moving house and I've had a container full of stuff for, for a, a long time, you know, old stuff that I thought, oh, I'll use this one day. I'll put it in the container, keep it out before I was moving house. And as I was moving house, I thought to myself, I'm moving to this, this, this nice new house. Um, do I need all this stuff, you know? Um, and, it, and, and it was interesting because I've also had this, this weird belief for many, many years that I, I want to keep things that are sentimental, quote, mm-hmm. sentimental, so that one day I have this vision of sort of going up to the loft, open up this box and going, wow. I remember this moment mm. and, um, and, and and maybe looking at it for 30 seconds and closing it and then maybe never seeing it again. And, and it'll be interesting. I'll talk about a little experience that I had a, a few moments ago with something that did come out of a, of a, a, a packed drawer. But um, at that time online, I saw your book pop up, um, mm-hmm. the, the, the Secret Life of Clutter. And I thought, what an opportune time to buy this book. So I did, and I Thank found you. it really interesting. And I, I found it really interesting for a few reasons. One, because what, what you probably don't know about me, Helen, is that I'm, I'm obsessed with human performance, human behavior, um, human potential, how people think. Mm-hmm. And a lot of our listeners know that because they know the type of guests that we have on. And um, your book wasn't about the very practical things of just throw away this and keep that and how to put things in boxes Mm -hmm. it was very much about the psychology of why people keep clutter so anyway that's that's me rabbiting on and and bringing some context to people so welcome looking forward to 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 our conversation today thank you and I'm glad you've bought my book and you found my book helpful and and actually I didn't want you know there's so many books out there on how to declutter and you know I I felt like that was already done and I I feel that people really relate to stories and I wanted to tell some stories and actually quite a few people have already have written to me and said something shifted in my mind and something's, you know, I've understood something about myself from reading your book. And that was really my intention, that it would bring compassion, that it would bring inspiration, that some some sort of self-understanding or self-awareness would come from, from reading it. And I feel that that's as valuable as any sort of strategy or technique that you can use. For sure. And, 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 and for the context of everybody that's listened to this, so Helen's written the book, Secret Life of Clutter, and it's 10 stories, I believe, of, of sort yeah. of experiences you've had with clients mm-hmm. and, um, and, and and coming from your background, because you, you, whilst you, you specialize in helping people with clutter, you are a psychotherapist, right? So this isn't yeah. just something that you thought, right, you got really good at organizing one day and thought mm-hmm. I can help other people organize. So mm-hmm. if, if we can kind of undo a bit of, of, of time because I'm, I'm I'm sure you wasn't sat there at school thinking, I can't wait to grow up <laughs> and, and help people organize their stuff um so so what what enabled you to to find yourself in in this position I think like most organizers you find yourself kind of finding a friend who's stuck and you know saying look I can help you and then you know in that process of helping friends realizing that actually you know you've got a talent for it but I think for me I went to art school and um at art school I was very interested in space um rather than just pictures and portraits and landscapes actually experiencing spaces so I created installations and I was very interested in how a space can change how you feel so you can walk into a space and be scared you can walk into a space and feel held and calm so that's in a way that's an ongoing theme throughout my life and I did um in you know I was an interior designer and now and then I worked with psychological space as a psychotherapist 
And so in a, a parallel in, in a parallel universe or in a parallel <laughs> reality, I was helping people um, declutter their homes. And actually that really works for me because there's a lot of sitting and talking when you're working as a psychotherapist. And when you work as a professional organizer and you're in someone's home and you're um, physically doing something, you can see the shifts really um, apparently in front of you. And I'm quite a physically engaged person. So that sort of, it, uh, I guess I've designed my life around my talents and my skills and my interests. I love it. Okay. Yeah. Really, really interesting. Um, or just, to, just touching on one piece. So there's a, there's a guy that I've, I've learned from over the years, um, uh, that you may have heard of Robert Diltz mm-hmm. and he had a model the neurological levels of change. And, and he talks about how be- be- your behavior will impact your environment, but also what's interesting when you sort of go the other way around in the pyramid. So there's a bit for, for the people that are listening to this, I mean, go and Google Robert Diltz, look, neurological levels of change or lo- logical levels of change. It's interpreted this in different ways. Environment is one of the actual only ways where it really works the other way round as well. Really? Typically, it works down, but environment does impact performance um, mm. and, and impact behavior. You know, so if you're in a particular environment, that will impact your behavior in in how you do things and, and what you do. And I was re- learning recently actually that, that there's a lot of studies around um, a, a, about associations where, for example, if you do if you take two groups of people that study in a particular room and then you get them to do the test and one group does the test in the room they studied in and another group do the test in the room in a different room typically Mm. the group that did the test in the room that they studied in actually performed better you know it's it's such a such an interesting well in a way what you've picked up is one of my tenants from my book which is that you know you can sit and talk in psychotherapy for 10 years about your clutter and not do anything about it But, you know, if you actually go in and make the changes and you see and experience the changes, it can start creating an internal shift. So I'm very much a believer in work on your inside and your outside, you know, that those both that both the the environment affect you, but also your psychological environment affect you. So um, I'm really interested in in that guy's pyramids. I'll have to go and have a look at that. Yeah, it's uh, it's, it's it's very good. So and, and and but then interesting. So you said you're interested in art, and and, and you went down that route. So what then led you to book up, sort of go down the route of becoming a psychotherapist out of interest? Um, well, I started um, doing art therapy. I was interested in um, you know, um, you know, bringing art to children actually at the time, and um, because there's something about a creative process that can access a part of the brain that the talking doesn't. So, um, so art therapy was how I got into therapy. And, and also I was very interested in psychology and, um, and our lives. And um, so it all kind of, it's all, all woven together in the end. Mm, Okay. Yeah. yeah. Well, look, I I, I think um, that there's, it it is, is very interesting how, our own interests can all intermerge and 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 i mean the, the concept of, of an icky guy and, and all that good stuff but yeah. um so let, let's break it down then what is clutter um well i like to say that clutter is decisions that haven't been made mm. um so so many of my clients will be procrastinators and they'll put off making decisions and so if you go through um a series of working through a cluttered room it's basically a series of making decisions and and so clutter is uh, are things that you have too many of um duplicates um where it's starting to affect the quality of your life um i like to think of your home as a bit like a battery charger so you go home and you recharge in the same way that you recharge your phone You, you your body needs a recharge but if you go home into an environment that's chaotic, it's full of stuff, you can't find things, you, it makes you stressed, that's not an environment that's going to recharge you. It's an, it's an environment that's going to drain you. So um, part of my process is about supporting people to make decisions because really it's either a decision about what do I want to keep this? Do I want to let this go? Um, do I really need this anymore? Or it's a decision about where does this live? You know, everything has its place, a place for everything. So if you don't have a a clear map of where things go in your home, that's going to contribute to the, to the chaos. I love your definition. 
Mm. Because a lot of the time when people think of clutter, I mean, I certainly did before I, I first read that was clutter is stuff. But when you use your definition, which just for the purposes of everybody, just to recap, your definition is clutter is decisions that haven't been made. It's so apt for the psychological aspect, isn't it as well? You know, there's so, how much, how much clutter, if you like, that we hold in our head because we've not made those decisions. Mm. Um, fascinating, absolutely fascinating. And, and, then, and, and one of the things that you, you talk about is, is how clutter holds you back and, and holds you back in the sense of having a, a, a home rather than a house full of stuff you know and in and, and as you you put it it's it's a a place for you to recharge a sanctuary if you like yeah. but then also you say about how it having clutter hold you back in life because it's true isn't it you know if, if we're not making decisions about the, the the tough decisions decisions about relationships the decisions about money the decisions about our professional careers and businesses you know these it's these these moments of indecision that, that cause us the, the the anxiety and the can can drag things out and, uh, and 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 prevent us from actually creating the outcomes that we want. Absolutely, and I think the thing is, I mean, one of the things that that people have told me because I've obviously spoken to hundreds of people over the last fifteen years, and that is, you know, oh, you know, I keep thinking I've got to clear the loft, or I keep thinking that I mean, I'm I'm wondering about you and your container. Did it? was it always in your mind, you know, in the back of your mind, you know, perhaps not in the front, but it's, you think you've got all these unmade decisions that are filling up your head. And then how can you be creative? Literally, because what's inside is reflected outside, which is, you know, another tenant of my book that your home is a reflection of your inner world. So if your inner mind is full of clutter and decisions that haven't been made, and you've got this voice in your head saying you must clear the loft or you must clear the garage or you must do this or you know how can you then have mental headspace for creating and moving forward you're kind of in a way you're thinking about the past you're pulled back by the the clutter in the past and you don't have any space to create and move forward does that do you relate to that yeah so it's it's interesting um and there's so many scenarios that I'm, I'm running through in, in my head um, because there's a the famous quote, which I, I don't necessarily agree with, but for a lot of people, it's how you do one thing is how you do anything. And I, I don't necessarily agree with that. And, and I'll bring that up later. But um, yeah, there, there are certain parts that you, you, you can use, like, for example, if everything looks pretty on the outside, and, and I'll, I'll use an example of this, you know, and, and I'm, I'm sure there's probably many. I, I, I think it's maybe a male thing. You might tell me different. <laughs> um, but as, as certainly a lot of my mates and, and myself and have, have had what I call a junk drawer, you know, oh, and yeah. that drawer man is where draw. all of yes. the man drawer, you know, where <laughs> stuff goes in, you know, that 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 Stanley knife or that that extra cable that I thought I might use one day or <laughs> what, whatever it is. And, and and I had it at my bedside for years and years and years. And this, this is the cute. I mean, put put it this way. When I went through it recently. I had like an old diary in there from 15 years ago, my first ever real sort of diary that I used, like a Filofax type diary with my, my first business cards I got given um, and, and things like that. But um, I, I suppose it is, and, and this is what you spent your, your, your life doing, is, is learning why people do what they do. I think for me, um, when we use the example of the, the container, that was there was an element of it, it was very practical. I'd moved house, I needed stuff to go there, so and I needed somewhere for for things to go. I think what what's more interesting for me is, I suppose, when you say about the indecision, but what why even have the indecision? And for me, I, I don't necessarily know if it was indecision with a lot of the stuff that I'd kept. It was the the beliefs that I had or the story that I told myself about why I should keep it mm -hmm. and I suppose that's in, an interesting part of the work that you do when when often you'll ask people I assume why mm -hmm. did they keep that thing um is there a pattern that you notice there well sometimes it's like so let's take the man drawer for example it's just like it's convenient and quick to just shove it in the drawer and that's mm -hmm. you know it's a kind of a perhaps it's an efficiency thing um, and it's, you know, and I'm not against a man draw, you know, or a don't know draw, which I talk about in my, in my book, but, um, you know, it's when your home is, a, is a, you know, or your garage or, you know, these spaces, you know, this room that could be used as a studio or an office or something is full of, of clutter. Um, mm. 
so some of the so that sometimes it's just literally just an an a poor use of, of of efficiency like but but often people keep stuff because of the sentimental um reasons or because they've had a trauma something you know they've had a a, a relationship breakdown or somebody's died or something really awful has happened and the stuff that they have reminds them of that event and they don't have the psychological support to or the emotional support to actually go through the stuff and they don't want to be reminded and fair enough you know and that's why you know in my uh, home declutter kit which is there um we have a gremlins card so you know i i do say sometimes things do are best left alone for a while um but really you know we locate ourselves in stuff you know things remind us like your file of facts reminded you of when you started your business so that's sometimes that you know i think meaning is really a part an important part of being a human being and and our objects have meaning and our objects are little location points of of events in our life and i think that's a healthy use of of, of objects isn't it that that we all have a sense of meaning but I think when it gets distorted and it becomes too much is that when everything has meaning or we're not able to choose which of those things, are, you know, um, I've got this file of facts that reminds me of starting my business, but then I've also got all of my leaflets and then I've got all of my business cards or I've got, you know, that's when it becomes um, a distorted use of meaning. And that's when it becomes problematic because if you've got all of that stuff, you can't move on. It's like, you know, it's a classic kind of thing. If your stomach's full, you can't eat any more food. If your brain's full, how can you, you know, be creative? So it's a, all about balance. Yeah, I, it's, it's, it's so, so true that you say that. So I, I talk a lot about bandwidth. You know, we have a mental bandwidth and I liken yeah. it to these days with with how we use the internet. Now, I'm one of these guys and, and it, it, it does make me laugh. Sometimes I take screenshots of post on social media and people go, oh my God, how do you function with that many tabs open? Yeah. You know, it's because I have yeah. so many tabs open and and that, that, that those tabs will be open, all those applications running on the, 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 the computer, they're using bandwidth and Absolutely. it starts to slow down. Eventually yeah. I get to the point where I've got so many tabs open that it crashes yeah. it crashes, and, and that's example. kind of what, what, what kind of happens. But I, I think for me, and, and this was what was really interesting having most recently done this is that it, it wasn't necessarily indecision. It was the memory piece, you mm. know, it, it was, um, the sentimental element and as I mentioned before I kind of you used to think of these I, I wanted to have these really I envisioned in the future of having these really nostalgic moments of reflection where I look back on certain things like that was an amazing like the, the, and I hope my girlfriend doesn't hear this but um I I, I for, for years like we're, we're talking like 15 plus years I used to I had kept albeit in this container in a box with a, like previous girlfriends photos mm. and little little things and then most recently I thought to because I, I was thinking one day this is what I used to think years ago one day it'd be how cool would it be to message that person out of the blue and go remember this but then now my rational mind was like well that's actually quite weird you know <laughs> that's, that's quite weird and, and they're now married with kids and you've got a, a, a partner and like to, to bring that up, it's like they're gonna think you're some sort of weird creep. So then I was like, actually, no, that's so this this was a, a past belief that I'd kept of thinking, oh, that'd be a really cool idea in the future, which actually now it made it very easy for me to go make the decision of no, let's chuck that stuff, you know. Of but but there are things I've got like, for I played ice hockey for many years and when I was going through this stuff, I was finding like my my old programs. Um and and I had thousands of these programs in boxes um one of the other things that was really interesting that i did was i remember so I, I used to really look up to and still do one one of my cousins and i remember going around my cousins one day and he my cousin was like quite cool you know like when you, you go around you get someone when you're younger and you're like 11 12 years old and they, they're cool so what they do you think oh they're cool i'll do what they do and he had this um felt board you know like the pin boards that you put drawing pins in football and and he had pinned up some designer clove labels of clothing that he bought and i thought that's a cool idea i want to be like my cousin so for nearly or oh, with more 15 years i'd kept every single label of clothing i had shoe boxes and shoe boxes of these labels and i just thought to myself why have i done this i did this once because when i was 13 years old i thought it was cool i was like 
I'm 30 years old now. I don't need to still be doing this. But it just <laughs> become a habit that becomes so unconscious that every time I took a took a piece of clothing, I kept the label in a, in a box. So, so all those sort of things got thrown. It's because I started to question the reasons why I was doing certain things, which I suppose is a lot of the, the work that you do when you're, 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 you're compassionately supporting people That's through it. making these decisions. Yeah. And I would say at that part, at that point, when you, did you say you were 13? That's the time uh, when you're, yeah, when you're looking for an identity identity and you've got a label that is an identity and and you know perhaps it's a designer label so it's a kind of a high prestigious sort of thing so something that you aspire to and you're trying to find a sense of of yourself and who you want to be in the world who how you want to show up so you know in a way everything that we collect has a story to tell and that tells a little bit of a story perhaps about you aspiring to to, to great things does that resonate or some yeah i i think i, I definitely think about the, the finding a, an identity i think a lot of my thing at that that age was a lot about significance i wanted significance mm. um that i i wanted to be able to have certain things that at that point in my time i i, I couldn't have um, until I started going out and, and getting them for myself, which yeah. I then did, and I, I, I suppose in like a in a maybe in a weird way, it was a form of um, almost like a little trophy. Maybe yeah. I don't know. Yeah. It was like a little mini trophy of well, you've got this. Keep that as a little trophy. I don't know. Yeah. This it's me just. On the top yeah. Of my head. No, and I think also you know I mean I'm sure you're aware as a coach of the idea of vision boarding, where mm. you you know you create a vision board of where you want to to go to, what you want to create in your life, and you know so the the if you've cre- created ke- collected labels of you know again prestigious things and you you want to create a prestigious business then it's a, a way it's, it's almost like a little way of vision boarding but in a box so it's a kind of an unconscious way of sort of telling your unconscious this is what I want to create you know something that is significant and um yeah I really think that the, the, the unconscious mind responds to images and that goes back to my art, th- art therapy days and that's why I think your home is so impor- important and one of the things that I struggle with or my clients struggle with and I try to help them is this idea of you know once we've decluttered and once we've got the home back to how they want it to be the fact that the unconscious mind has has taken a picture and has seen it in chaos for so long we then have to work really hard at, at kind of like reframing that and saying no this is the new image this is the new this is the vision board of the house that I want to create So because there'll there'll always be a tendency to want to go back because it's become familiar and because the the unconscious has has seen it on a daily basis. So it's really what you feed your mind is so important. You know, we talk about going out and being in nature and feeding your mind some calm trees and some beauty. And, you know, that's that nourishes our soul, but it also helps our mind to think um when we create space to think but if you've got a visual chaos all around you all the time all the time it's very difficult to think yeah i i can definitely empathize with that i it's a, to the point where in in my office i i i treat my office a bit like this i've got a little home office and office here and and i do treat it like a sanctuary like yeah. no matter how late i'm running for something see that. I, I, I didn't yeah I, I don't leave this office until it's tidy you know yeah. they, it, it, so so when i come in the next day it's clean and i have yeah. that environment and i've I've said often when and when, when working with with clients is that um i can see at these days on zoom i do a lot of stuff on zoom, if i can see that everything behind them is in absolute chaos then it does give a bit of an insight into what's going on in their mind and, and you know that yeah. better than anyone yeah but um but but let, let's let look at this because like most things in life, there's a spectrum, right? And mm-hmm. when I mean, most people think of maybe clutter, they go, "Oh no, no, I, I don't collect loads of clutter." Because what they're actually thinking of is hoarders, and mm-hmm. we've seen the TV programs yeah. of where people come in, you, you you can't even open their front door and and, and work around, and, and and that's sort of the extreme. So what what is the difference between someone that's got a bit of clutter versus sort of the the hoarders, the people that have have got these houses that that you can't even walk into? Um, well, I mean, I think I talk very much in my book and I'm kind of clear that I'm working with people that, are, you know, yes, you're right. It's a spectrum. And I'm working with people who have clutter rather than hoard, um, because once you get into the hoarding end of the scale, you're looking at, um, you know, it's, it's now 
put in the DSM as a diagnosis of a mental health condition. So it really does need specialist kind of support. And um, and I think the key difference for me would be is about um, willingness to let things go. You know, it's not it's not easy to let things go, especially when you've got sentimental attachment to things. But if you're if you if you're not in touch with reality and how that's having an impact, perhaps on someone that you live with, it's on how it's having an impact on you and your life, your, the quality of your life, then that's starting to move into the hoarding scale. Um, it's not necessarily going to be easy to declutter and let go of a load of stuff. But if you're if you're not if you're not willing to let go of things, then you know you're perhaps slightly on that that scale of things. Yeah. So. Um, you know, I talk about, I've got a little book that you can download from my website called seven mistakes of a declutter project or something. And, um, and one of the key things there is, is, um, denial that, you know, if you're in denial about how it's impacting you or how it's impacting someone else, or you keep saying, oh, I'm going to sort it out. I'm going to do it at the weekend and the weekend never comes because something else happens. That's another form of denial, isn't it? So that's mm-hmm. when you're in the kind of hoarding end of end of the scale but there are you know clear definitions of of hoarding um and uh in, in and it does impact it, it not only impacts their their life but the people and the neighbors and and everyone so it's yeah it's a serious condition yeah um in in the work that you do i know there's a there's a big emphasis on that you work with people and and use compassion Mm-hmm. around the work that you you do what what do you mean by that i mean by that that a lot of people who contact me or you know that have clutter and they may be listening to this show feel a lot of shame there's a lot of shame not only around that i've got too much stuff or that i can't do something about it what is wrong with me that i can't sort this out So, um, I mean, I've had people say to me, you know, I go to the front, if somebody rings on the front doorbell, I put my coat on, you know, to pretend that I'm going out as a way of avoiding inviting them in because I don't want anyone to come into my home. And then people would say to me, you know, like I've isolated myself, you know, I don't have people around. And, And when we, you know, we sit down and we talk about what's your vision, where would you like to be? I'd really like to have a home that I could invite people into. So there's, it's almost like it becomes a secret, you know, something that is hidden behind closed doors. You go out to work, you're very functional, then you come home. And then there's this, this thing that nobody knows about you, except for you. And then it's it's almost like something that you carry around. Um, So that, so I think it's really important to be compassionate um, and, and, and understanding and not to be judgmental with um, people who are feeling in deep shame and, and to, to actually have been able to reach out and talk and say, you know, look, I need help is a massive, massive step, mm-hmm. you know, even to let somebody into the house and see it on a, you know, on a professional basis is, is huge for some people. Yeah. And, and I, I suppose a lot of that is because people have, have got to that point where they've, they've created an element of helplessness sort of learn help um, sort of helplessness and, and almost like a little bit of hopelessness but that that reach out that 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 action is is the first step in saying look that's i, I want to deal with this and, and that in itself is something to be to to be be acknowledged and um and and sort of meet them where they are and and sort of help accelerate getting yeah. getting back to a point where they want to be absolutely change doesn't happen until you can acknowledge that you've got a problem and that and that you can ask for help Mm. and and i think you know a a significant thing is that people um you know may have been through a trauma may have been through a bereavement may you know like i was talking to someone recently who'd been through a, a terrible divorce and um and life had to stop you know you go into survival mode and you're just literally dealing with getting the kids to school or, you know, and then lots of other things get waylaid and then they build up. So sometimes literally, you know, I'll go in and help someone declutter. And it's really just kind of clearing that, clearing the decks from that period of time to get them back into, into the the here and now, if you like. I always think about clutter as, again, as about living in debt. And I, I loved your example of, of clearing your desk and um, coming into 
you know, into work in the morning for a clear desk. Because if you don't do that, you come into your office and you've got yesterday's stuff stuff yeah to yeah. deal with before you can start today it's the same with you know i talk about the, doing the washing up or whatever if you're coming down to the kitchen and you can't cook because you've got yesterday's stuff in the kitchen that's like living in debt isn't it so mm. how you can't save if you've got lots of debt that you're paying for so really what we're trying to do is get into this present moment where everything is you know life is always going to be throwing us curveballs isn't it um, but if we can get our, ourselves in a little bit of a balance and even keel and and then we can deal with what's coming. So that that's that's the thing, you know, that sometimes people have just just ended up having a, a bit of a tough time and, and clutters accumulated. And I know that, you know, actually at the moment, sorry, I was only going to say something, no, but I'm, 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 I'm studying at the moment and there's lots of things that are having to be put on the sidelines because this is my focus. You know, but I know that this is a period of time and that I'll get back to those things. So, but, so that's, that's life sometimes. For sure. So let, let's talk practically then, because there's a part that I want to come to, and I, I definitely want to do, make sure that we, we talk about, um, which is actually interesting what you just mentioned, which is something that's your focus right now, which is your yeah. masters. We're going to come back yeah. to that. Um, what are some practical things that people can do? People are listening to this and they've been putting off going and sorting the shed or putting off and going and, and, and doing the, the, the garage um, or, or, or they know they've got loads of drawers where they've let all the papers build up and they just haven't got to it. Um, what are some really practical things that people listening to this can start to do to make that change? Um, I would say, you know, the most important thing is to just carve out some time, you know, um, put a weekend aside don't try and declutter and um, bake a cake and do social media. <laughs> you know, it's just like, just give yourself a, a, a window of time. Of, and, and, and also because it's stuff, isn't it? And when you get stuff out, it makes a lot of mess. So you need mm. to be able to process it, take it to the dump, take it to the charity shop and put your life back before you can then move on to, to your next day. It's a bit like if you were baking a cake, <laughs> you wouldn't just bake the cake and then leave everything would you you know you'd know you'd have to put yourself a bit of time aside um to do that so put, um that's really important then then it's really important that you understand that you're going through a decision making process and that you're kind of going to be um not necessarily brutal but you're going to be you're going to be tough with yourself you know like maybe you've got that box of uh, of labels that you talked about and they, they've got a sentimental and maybe they were inspired you to, to become a great person, but just take some photos, take some mm. photos of that box, take some photos of some of those things just to, so you've got those located, you know, I was talking about locations of, of memories. So you've got those on your phone or, you know, however you want to um, do that. So taking photos is really important. Be brutal, be honest with yourself. Um, make time and then you know um so it's decisions then it's about finding homes for things everything is has its place a place for everything so many people say that to me we want this we really want that um and then the next thing is really about it's about maintaining you know if you if you don't do the washing up it's going to grow so you've got to keep um, if you're buying books on a regular basis, which I have to hold my hand up, I do, then you're going to need to um, let some go, you know, so the, the principle of one in, one out. So the, it's really important to, 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 to maintain your space. Otherwise, it's just going to go back to, to clutter. So I, I, I adopted that. So one, so this, this, this is a really interesting conversation and, and, and I wasn't expecting to go here, but we're going to go here. Um, mm -hmm. So the, 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 what I've shared in the podcast, so we were like, this is going to be like 130 something episodes. But in the very, very first episode, I explained, or one of the first episodes, um, I explained why I do what I do and the work that I do. So for those of you that are avid listeners and have, have either gone right back to the beginning and have <laughs> caught up or started at the beginning, sort of many years ago when we started this podcast, you'll know that um, I grew up with a belief that money equaled happiness and, and went off on this journey. And one of the first things that I did when I started making lots of money when I was younger was I could then go out and buy designer clothes. And that's mm -hmm. what I did. So I um, really valued clothes. And I, I, I remember being like 19 years old and having like 40 pairs of shoes and trainers. It was mm -hmm. just ridiculous. Um, and I have a, 
uh, had up until recently a very big, big wardrobe of lots of clothes. But some of these clothes I've had for like 15 years Mm -hmm. thinking, oh, but, but, but I remember that moment. And I think I had to think to myself, I'm never going to wear that again. Mm -hmm. And it was the principle of, look, if, if I can, remove this and, and and I look at it very much from a replacement point of view mm-hmm. rather than keep adding 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 yeah. adding all the time yeah. then I'm, I'm and, and it was it was really freeing bagging up all those clothes taking them to the charity shop it was a really really sort of freeing situation because I didn't realize quite how bad it had gotten so I decided that I needed, I was going to move out and I was like I've got about six wardrobe space six different wardrobe long rails that sort of double rails of, of all these different clothes that I need to start start sort of moving on and um that that principle of one in one out is is mm-hmm. definitely something that's been done interestingly i suppose the position that i'm in at the moment you said about books that i i i i have a lot of books um interestingly i i listen to books more nowadays than i i do actually buy them so they're sort of in a digital form but um but but i i, I don't give away any books not yet at least maybe i'm in that position with maybe in a few years I'm, i might yeah. have a different view but i think it's because the these days it's something i value so highly and we'll, we'll come back on to to value in a minute um but uh but yeah that that sort of let something go to replace it i think it's a really powerful um way of 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 being and there's a there's a um a documentary that i've maybe if i'll get around to this weekend i've not actually watched it the minimalists Mm. Um, i was just thinking about that actually because actually do we need all this stuff mm. you know i'm not necessarily an advocate for minimalism as such but you know you know 40 pairs of shoes like you know do you need all that stuff and and then actually it becomes then you you go to put on a pair of shoes or trousers or whatever, and then you've got to make a decision because there's so many to choose from. And then mm-hmm. we complicate our lives so much that, you know, to actually just have a, a simpler life, it, you know, is probably a lot easier. When the, the clothing side of things, I, I remember um, the first time I heard of it was, was people talking about um, Steve Jobs because Steve Jobs always used to wear a black roll neck, you know, yeah. when he used to speak. Yeah. Yeah. And I, I remember having this hearing this moment. I thought like, I completely understand why he did it because I used to do, I don't do it as much now. I used to do a lot of speaking events. I mean, we used to run 70, 80 events a year. And I would be really mindful of the clothes that I was wearing. So people didn't think I wore the same clothes all the time. Mm. But that was hard work. Just mm. whereas now I wear it most days I wear it a t-shirt it's like a black one it's a blue one it's a white one or gray one whatever it's a ve- very very simple and i'm just not not that bothered um i think, I think simon cowell's the same he just wears a gray t-shirt or, or you know yeah yeah and, and and then i heard i can't remember where it was but th- there was a thing which someone it was either a blog or a video or something i watched about decision fatigue mm, and exactly. you can get decision fatigue and you probably know more about this than i do um and 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 when you're a leader of some sort, you're having to make big decisions. And it's a bit like the whole bandwidth thing that we said about earlier, the, 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 the less smaller decisions you have to make, the better, yeah. you know, you don't, then you don't, even things as simple as what you're going to eat that day. You know, if the foods, all, if you know what you're already having, you don't have to think about it. It's done what you're going to wear that day. Cause you know, you've like in my instance, you've got your white t-shirt, your black t-shirt, whatever. Um, it, it just becomes, you, you have more bandwidth to be able to make the bigger decisions rather than having had to have made lots of little decisions that all, all accumulate. Yeah, exactly. So if you've got a certain amount of mental energy that you've, you know, it's a bit like having a budget each day, isn't it? You've got so much mental energy. What do you want to spend it on? Do you want to mm. spend it on making those little dishes, decisions on the shrapnel as it were, or the big decisions or the create, you know, creating something and making something in your life and, or spending your time and your energy on, um, nourishing things, whatever they are, you know, you're fulfilling your business objectives or, you know, having time to be creative or spend time with your kids or whatever. But I, I'm totally, you know, with you on that, that sense. And actually, you know, I, I, I do practice, a, um, I'm Zen, a Zen meditation practice. And when I've been on retreat, um, you know, everything is really structured you know, the food is at this time, then you meditate, you know, you meditate, then you have food and da, 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 da. And, and it's all done particularly to free your mind. If you know that the structure is there, you just follow the structure and then your mind, then you do your meditation practice and you watch your mind, but obviously that's meditation, but it's, it's all done deliberately 
to to contain the 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 rabbit mind or the 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 monkey mind or whatever you want to call it Mm. question for you so um you you mentioned about the zen side of things so often um i i I think this is 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 is, um quite interesting so take take a zen garden like a japanese zen garden and it's and it's designed to create an element of tranquility Mm -hmm. and calm and peace and um I, I, I can't imagine you have lots of clutter in your house, but I also don't imagine it's necessarily sort of like this Zen completely. Everything's pristine all of mm-hmm. the time. And I, I'm a big fan of, of Stoic philosophy. And mm-hmm. one of the, a lot of the Stoics will say is that when it comes to creating peace and calm, there's sort of what you might have Buddhist monks do, which is they, they take themselves out of sort of the, the, the let's call it real world for mm-hmm. argument's sake to create that calm, which is almost like a, a false sense of of calm because they've put themselves in that position versus being able to be a little more let's say stoic which is learning how to control perceptions and actions and decisions by being moment. able to deal with the environment when the yeah. environment isn't right what yeah. where's your stance on that um i'm with i'm probably with you on that but i do think there is value of of taking yourself off and having an experience of being in the in the cave or in the mountain or in the monastery because it gives you an opportunity to find a place in yourself that you can't when you're dealing with life's happenings all the time but i'm totally with you you know which is why i mean one of the zen sayings is trot wood carry water you know mm. and that's daily life you know and you can make that your practice you can be mindful about your washing up you know actually my husband cooks and i and i do the the cleaning up and and i actually really enjoy it it's just it's the time that I just have a little bit of mindful practice and put put the place back and as you say come down to the new to the new space in the morning so I'm you know I'm very much into um be in the world and and live life like that um it's interesting that though this thing about the small decisions um you know I had a coach once and they said you know Helen don't deal with all these little things deal with the big things. And I, and I've thought about that quite a lot. And I thought, well, that's a good philosophy, isn't it? However, if you've got this, so many little things that haven't little decisions that haven't been made, they build up. And, and so I think my, what I'm saying to people is take some time off and deal with those little things and then get back to the big things. So, because those little things, they, they niggle at you and they do kind of, they do grind you down eventually you know, like we'll go through things and people say, oh, those are the frames that I want to frame. Like, well, when are you going to do that? Are you just going to have this project that's never been, you know, either you're going to do it or you're not going to do it. So make the decision, make the time, do it and then move on. But it's like, we kind of like, and sometimes it's about not being honest with ourselves, you know, like, well, actually I'm never going to, you know, I'm never going to, I don't sit and read, say, for example, I've sat down with people and they've got all these books. When do you sit down and read? I don't read anymore. Okay. So let's be honest about this, all of these books or, you know, I've got all these party dresses, but I don't go out anymore, you know? So it's something about, and sometimes that's tragic as well. You know, say you've, 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 you you don't go out to parties anymore and you're married and it's something that you just don't do. And it's about mourning a period of that life, that period of your life that we change and we can't always hold on to the past you know, that they're, you know, that thing that life get the only guarantee in life is that there's going to be change. Yeah. I, I think um, it's it, like you say, it's that evolution, isn't it? It's, it's realizing actually we don't, it, it was part of our life. Yeah. It doesn't necessarily need to be moving forward, but it's making that conscious decision exactly. or turning around going, actually, we don't go out anymore. I really want to go out. Well, let's change that then. Let's start going out and and, and make the decision one way or the other, which comes back to your decision-making piece around what clutter is. Um, So we we spoke about the home um, and a lot of people that listen to this, they're going to be entrepreneurs, they're business owners, they're, they're, they're ambitious professionals and work or their business is a, a big component of their life. Actually, sorry, before we come back to that, there's, there's something I just wanted to say that, when you were talking about the little decisions and I'm talking mm-hmm. about little and big and little and bigger mm-hmm. subjective, of course mm-hmm. they are. Yeah. So I, with my clients, I, I talk about um, priorities 
and 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 if 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 you fill your day with high priority if you don't fill your day with high priority activities your day gets filled with low priority activities but that's the point it's is it, it whilst it might be a little thing it could actually be a high priority mm. you know and and it's it's a case of getting getting that done and yeah. and getting it over the line um, because it's it's niggling away and, and one of my mantras that certainly with a, a number of business owner clients of mine as they're looking to scale and grow and develop uh, a sort of a mantra that I get them to tattoo onto their forehead um, is it needs to be done but I don't need to do it so sometimes the, the the picture frames that need to go on the wall it's like well you want them on the wall you need to get them done you're not doing it just get someone else to do it and then you can crack on and, and, and move on but um, yeah I, I thought that was quite interesting yeah. you, me talk about the little and big it's yeah. it's it, it's it's the the that, like you say those those lots of little things whilst yes they are little but they are important to get them done so that then you can you can work on the uh the the other higher priority activities in, in that moment but um yeah. sorry we, we digress so we, we speak a lot about home and like i was saying there's lots of people that listen to this that works a really big component of their life and a lot of the the time with the work that you're, you're doing, um, I know you're, you're going to a lot of people's homes and working with them, but you're studying for something right now, aren't you? Mm-hmm. Yeah, I'm studying for, I'm, I'm doing a research master's in psychodynamic psychotherapy combined with research. So <laughs> looking at um, why people might be um, cluttered at home, but organized at work. And that's sort of what, what what's going on there. Why, why are we performing well at work? but not at home. So quite often it it relates to how we value ourselves. And, you know, um, people will, so say, for example, you're sharing your flat um, and you might have, and and I talk about one of this, these cases in my, in my, in my book, Um, you know, the communal areas are all nice and tidy because everyone's seeing that, but actually my room is a shit shit pit, you know, so, Mm. you know, what is that, you know, what is that about? And, you know, in my research is is trying to understand a little bit more about that. So I'll I'll update you, I'll update you all on on that when I when I finished it. Yeah. What would I, mean, I know you're still doing the research, but sort of on your years and years of experience, um, what 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 do you believe? Maybe without the research, but just sort of your own opinions on on what the reason that's the case. Um, because. The home is where our emotional self lives and um, we take, we can kind of detach ourselves a little bit more from our emotional self. So when we go to work, we can be in much more of a performative mode. Um, And, but when we come home, we're more in contact with our emotional stuff. So if we've had childhood trauma, if we've had, um, you know, difficult experiences, then they will be living in our house with us. So if we don't deal with those, then they kind of get buried. So I, I kind of talk about clutter as also a burial mound for trauma. So we can, to a certain extent, you can't run away from that, you know, and so you can run away from it to a, and go out to work and perform really well and, and be functional. But um, you, it's always going to be there and it tends to get sort of hidden in the loft or hidden in the side room or, you know, um, so so trauma is 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 something that that's and, and also people who um, perhaps they grew up in, in a cluttered, chaotic hoarding environment. Um, they may either have rebelled against that or they will have of what we say um they've identified with it so they've recreated it so it's unconscious um but they but they still have the shame about it so i talked earlier about shame so there's lots of complex reasons why why people have clutter maybe they've maybe they've moved from another country and um they've been torn away from their homeland or something so then we we get really um much much more rooted in a, in a place because we don't want to be torn away from it again yeah yeah, I, I, I just, I, f- I find it fascinating. I mean, I think that um, from a, what one of the, the, the processes that I go through with my clients is we, we help them identify what their values are. And, and, and I, I do it in two different ways. And the way I break it down is we have means values, which are things that we do. And we have end values, which we're either moving away from or towards, um, which are typically feelings. And the, 
the, the best me, what I call means values, things that you do process that I've come across in terms of identifying what your true values are is, is a process by a guy called Dr. John D. Martini, who I don't know mm-hmm. if you're familiar with. Yeah. Um, and he's got what I deem to be one of the best values determination process in the world. It's 13 questions. And one of the questions is where are you most ordered, ordered and organized? Mm-hmm. And, um, what what's what's interesting is because i i know that i'm certainly one of these people and had been for many years is that i when when i used to think about that it's like well i used to be really ordered and organized with my wardrobe you know mm-hmm. i knew it was that all the shirts were that lace and then the the the, the t-shirts were there and all the jeans were here and everything was like that because I, I clearly valued clothing or more specific personal image and things like mm-hmm. that at that point. Um, and then now at work, it's particularly ordered and organized um, with, with work related things. And, and I, and I just wonder if, if you kind of notice that pattern that if it's, if it's at work, if people don't really care about their work and they're just, they, they, they sort of go to work with 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 resentment and 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 and, and whatnot then maybe they are more um disorganized at work but then they come home because they really value family maybe and and, and and i didn't know if that's something you've seen it's or- normally the other way around it's normally um people are more functional at work and right. cluttered at home so that's kind of what i'm looking at because if somebody's chaotic and disorganized at work, it's probably a systemic thing. So they may be a bit ADHD, they're cluttered wherever they go. You know, they're kind of creative, mm. scattered. They're always getting distracted, but it's more exactly what you're saying in terms of value. So if someone really values their work and their job, they're more likely to be organized and ordered and, and kind of on top of it and then come home and then just chuck things on the floor or, you know, not put their shoes or coat away or whatever. But that's because the work environment is something that they value because it gives them a sense of self-esteem. Mm. So they feel esteemed and they feel valued. Um, whereas at home, who's giving you a sense of self-esteem? If your boss isn't there or your colleagues aren't there, then you have to esteem yourself. And so esteeming yourself is much more difficult if you if you live on your own or if you're if you've been in a marriage for 30 years or something and you don't really care about, you know, you sort of take your partner for granted. So self-esteem is something that in a place where you have to do it for yourself. If, if, you, if you've had a traumatic childhood and you haven't learned how to self-care or self-esteem, then you will probably you know, struggle to, to give yourself a, an, an orderly environment. Or it may just not be high on your values. So there are some people that just don't really connect with the visual environment. You know, like I'm very visual, which is why I was talking earlier about the the subconscious. You know, if you're somebody who's a professor and you just read books, you probably don't even see your environment. You're just focused on the details of of the books. So, you know, it's very difficult to come up with a a definitive one word answer Mm. because I believe that we're all very different. And, you know, you've talked about Um, John Demartini and I'm very interested in the Enneagram and I really believe that we're all you know we have different personality types and therefore we meet the world in a different way plus so we have a personality type plus we have different trauma plus we have different influences plus we get our values and self-esteem from different places so you know I really and that's why one of my things is that it's not just stuff it's about a person and a person is very complex (laughs) yeah and so you're dealing with the person and their relationship with their stuff um that that makes it really fascinating and interesting and obviously that's why I've been doing it so long because it's not you know clutter and creating order is quite banal in in lots of ways but but actually you know when you looking at the person and their life story it becomes, you know, much more engaging and, and interesting. And that's why I wrote my book really was because I wanted to get this point across that it's not just about boxes and how you how you do your system, which I've got in my home declutter kit, but, you know, it's about people and people have life stories and they have personalities and they have diff- there are different reasons why they're in a muddle. But actually, if you can sort out the muddle and that, that was, you know, what I was saying in, in some of the stories is that life can change. You know, people have mm. these radical life changes when they sort out, deal with the trauma or deal with the clutter or deal with the gremlin when they're ready. Yeah, no, I, 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 I love what you've just said there about the self-esteem element of it. I, I, I talk a lot about accountability and 
my, my view is that we, we've been conditioned over uh, over our lifetimes to be accountable when we're born we're accountable to our parents we're to mm-hmm. school we're accountable to our teachers we get to work we're accountable to our bosses whatever but like you say you come home and and, and if if you've, you've not got that person to hold you accountable or not just accountable but but also hold you to a higher standard you know mm-hmm. hold, like what is that higher standard like call the calling your partner out on something that you that, that you know is sort of maybe not best for them long term in terms mm. of experience like there's, there's going to make yeah, okay it might not feel good in the moment you know yeah sure it's much easier to chuck your clothes on the floor than hang them up in the moment but it's 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 uh, hold on a minute what what standard are you your what's your personal standards uh that, that you're holding yourself to I, I love that and and it's also you know so being able to esteem yourself is about being able to say you know I I'm worth this mm. I'm worth you know, creating this order for or this environment, you know, I'm worth it. And, uh, you know, a lot of people, you know, like you say that it's, it's very easy to do the other focused, you know, to, and, and I, for me, when I, when I left a, a job and I, I decided, right, if I don't go self-employed now, then that's it. It's never going to happen. And I really struggled to get up and get on with it. You know, it was, it was like a complete different mindset change that there wasn't a boss to get to work to, to, there wasn't a naughty stick, you know, saying you're late, you know, it was like, now I've got to do it, you know? So when I started my business, how difficult I found it to, um, to do, you know, to actually discipline myself to, 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 to do it for myself, to get mm. out of that work mindset where I was focused on working for a boss or pleasing the boss or whatever. Yeah. Okay, cool. Um, so there's going to be a lot of people that have been listening to this and we've mentioned the book on a few occasions. So the, the, the book is The Secret Life of Clutter. Yeah, I've got it here. Um, I'm going to show you. There we go. It's my yeah, book. Great little book. And um, where, where can people get it? Where can people go and get it? Um, yeah. Um, well, you can get it from Amazon. That's that's where yeah. it's for sale. So or Waterstones or any, any local bookshop. Um, and uh, yeah. Wonderful. So if you go, go and get the book, if you're intrigued, go and get the book. But if, if people are looking for some more practical things and thinking, well, look, the, the book's okay, but actually I could just really do some really practical things of, of how they can get support from you. Um, how can people do that? Um, join my mailing list at helensanderson.com. Um, and I do regular talks, uh, webinars. Um, in the autumn, I've got the, uh, an online group experience called The Clutter Shift. Um, which is a great accountability group. And um, you can get my home declutter kit, which is um, over there. <laughs> um, and that's available on Amazon or on my website, helensanderson.com. So that, that's a system and a strategy that you can use. Wonderful. So guys, um, definitely go and check out Helen. Head to helensanderson.com. If you say, actually, do you know what? I could really do with some practical stuff here. The uh, home declutter kit is, is useful, but I, I, do, I do recommend, you know, the, the what, what I found fascinating is when listening to your book, the, the different stories, the, the fables, uh, they're not mm-hmm. even fables, they're all our stories, but the, the, the way that we learn is from stories, you know, we've been yeah. brought up on stories and yeah. the messages within those stories are, are really quite impactful when they do stop and make you go, know, actually um so I, I recommend people do that well helen it's, it's been fantastic i've loved our conversation thank yeah. you so much for joining me yeah. and um you, you've definitely had an impact on on how my home currently looks having listened to the book and uh and i've had some really interesting conversations from now i think it'd be really good for us to catch up when you finish your masters and you've got that research i think we can have a great conversation about the uh the, yeah, it comes the, the, the findings the, yeah, yeah the findings of of, <laughs> of why people are all organized at work and not at home i think that'd be a fantastic interesting episode and we can pick that up at that point but um, yeah thanks for, for joining us and for everyone that's been listening go and check out helen um thanks again helen and speak soon thank you very much everyone else until next time make it happen thank you for listening to this episode of the make it happen with will polston podcast make sure you join will's free facebook group the make it happen community please support the show by subscribing on itunes spotify stitcher soundcloud or google play share this episode with at least one friend you think would benefit from it and give will a five-star review wherever you download your podcasts until next time make it happen